Hello there and welcome back to another video. In today's video, I'm going to be reattempting one of my previous projects on this channel, and that was my project where I tried to make USB-C Arduino Nanos. In that video, which came out a little over a year ago, I attempted to take the Arduino Nano schematic and design a custom PCB based off of it that would instead of using the regular mini USB port, use a USB-C port. It was a fun idea to try and remake one of my favorite microcontrollers with a much better USB connector, but it was also intended to be a major practice project for developing my PCB design, SMD soldering, and microcontroller building skills. Now that I've had a long time since that project to think about reattempting it and to mess with some of the controllers, one of which I was actually able to get working for a short while, thanks to several of your comments, I want to reattempt this project but I want it to be even cooler. So instead of remaking the Arduino Nano, I'll be remaking another great microcontroller that I need to work with more, the Raspberry Pi Pico. This microcontroller is a lot more modern than the ATmega 328P that's present on the Arduino Nano, or at least the version of the Nano that I was attempting to recreate. Therefore, it has a lot of really awesome features, some of which I enjoy using, and many of which I don't understand at all. It runs faster, uses external flash, and has more I.O. though, all of which are things that I can appreciate. Now, there are some things that I don't love about the original Pico, and those things are that its board is quite wide, and also it uses a micro USB port. I know that the board is sized the way that it is because it makes it easier to route the whole circuit in two layers to bring down production cost, but the micro USB port, I think we can make this better. So I pulled up the RP2040 hardware design datasheet and pulled the schematics straight from there to create my own RP2040 based board. Now, really quickly, I would like to mention that yes, I am aware of the existence of the RP2350, which is a really awesome looking chip, but for the time being, I wanted to stick to the 2040 because it's a microcontroller I'm familiar with as I've never used a 2350 before. There are two key design changes in my circuit versus the circuit that the Pi Pico utilizes, and those are that one, my circuit is wired to a USB-C port with the two necessary 5.1 kilo ohm resistors installed so that it can be powered off of a native USB-C power supply, and two, my board uses a linear voltage regulator as opposed to the switching voltage regulator on the Pi Pico. I went linear for my design because I'm not very comfortable working with switching regulators yet, so it was simpler for me, but also this design should introduce less noise into the ADCs on the microcontroller. And I tend to use these ADCs quite often in my projects, so therefore, I appreciate having a cleaner readout from them. Technically, there is one other deviation from the Pi Pico, and that is with the flash chip. Of course, I'm using one from a different series than the one that's used on the Pico already, but the main difference that actually matters is the size of its memory. The Pico uses a two megabyte flash chip and therefore has two megabytes of program storage on it, and my microcontroller uses the biggest supported flash chip by the RP2040, so I have a 16 megabyte flash chip on my boards, meaning I have program storage for days. I was able to cram all of this onto a PCB that, while being slightly longer than the Pico, is also significantly thinner and therefore a decent bit more breadboard friendly. This sits symmetrically on a breadboard with three holes of extra space on the side of each row of its pins and I'm very happy about this. I was also able to do this while keeping all of the components on the board hand solder friendly for both myself and everyone who wants to follow the tutorial linked in the description to build their own. But anyway, that's enough about what I designed, let's actually build them. Of course, to build these boards, I'm going to need some PCBs to solder the components to, especially because with all of these SMD parts, it would be literally impossible to breadboard this circuit or to make it on a proto board. So I took my finalized Gerber files from my PCB design and headed over to the website of the sponsor of today's video, PCBWay, to place an order for my PCBs. PCBWay offers a ton of great custom manufacturing services, such as 3D printing, sheet metal production, CNC machining, and of course, PCB production. PCB production is the service that I'll be using today, and so I took my production files and uploaded them to the order page. My board is a four layer board, and the number of layers and size were automatically detected for me, which was super convenient. So all I had to do to set up my order was choose how many boards I wanted, what color of solder mask they should be made with, and what surface finish I wanted. With these boards, the rest of the settings being default was perfect, as I don't need thicker copper than one ounce per foot squared for current handling capability, and the settings for things like vias were set properly already. 
In particular, the vias need to be covered with solder mask so that solder won't stick to them and short things out. I also added an SMD stencil to my order to spread solder paste because the RP2040 is in a package where solder paste is kind of necessary to solder it. After all of that was set, I placed my order and waited for the boards to arrive. If you're thinking of recreating this project or any of my other projects, or if you have a project of your own, check out PCBWay at the link in the description to use their services today. A while later, my order of PCBs arrived and they looked beautiful. Everything was exactly as I had expected it to be and I was super ready to get to soldering these things together. So I took one of the new PCBs and used the stencil that I had included with my order to apply solder paste to the front side with the RB2040 chip and the USB-C port. And then I stuffed the front side of the board with all of its components and reflowed the solder paste with some hot air. This was my first time ever fully soldering a board using this method, and so it wasn't quite perfect the first time, but with some cleanup with the soldering iron, I thought that it looked pretty good. I then flipped the board over and began stuffing the back with all of its components. I purposefully made sure to design these boards in a way that the bottom of the PCB was entirely hand soldering friendly, as if you had to reflow both sides of the board, it's possible that when you flipped it over to do one side, components could fall off of the other due to their solder melting. So only one side is to be hot air reflowed, and after the back side of the board was complete and headers were added, I was ready to test this board. I figured that since I'd basically followed the hardware design data sheet to the T, I should be greeted with a perfectly functional microcontroller right out of the gate. Right? Well, the universe didn't have that in its plans for me, which is a bit of a bummer. Instead, I plugged the board into my computer and got absolutely nothing. In fact, the power LED on the PCB didn't even light up, indicating that I had some pretty serious power issues somewhere. So I went back and checked my schematic and PCB designs and realized the issue almost immediately. It turns out that the footprint and symbol I had used for the USB-C port weren't set up properly, and this meant that although everything in my schematic was wired properly, in the PCB, it wasn't. And this was because the link was bad between the symbol and its footprint's pins, which meant that the pins on the USB-C port symbol that handled VBUS and ground were not properly linked to the pads on the footprint, and so VBUS and ground never got connected in the PCB. I should have caught this when I was designing it, but I guess I didn't. So I fixed the footprint and got prepared to order new PCBs, after I first installed some bodge wires and attempted to see if I could get the rest of the circuit working. I ended up stuffing another PCB in this process, and after a lot of tinkering, I discovered that the 3.3 volt GPIO pin on my microcontroller also wasn't connected to the 3.3 volt power bus in the board, because I had used a 3v3 net flag for that pin and was using plus 3.3 volts everywhere else. And so I had to fix that in the schematic too. I better not forget to do that and order the new boards without fixing it. That would just be tragic wouldn't it? In any case, with this abomination of an Arduino Nano powering my board through its 3.3 volt rail and the USB ground connection being made by plugging the Nano and my custom board into the same USB hub that has a shared ground to upload the code, I was actually able to get a Blink sketch running. So I went ahead and ordered the new boards, which shared the same layout as the old boards and therefore could be soldered with the same stencil, and I got straight to work assembling one of them the same way as before. After the board was all built up, I plugged it into power, but to my dismay, the power LED did not come on. So the first thing that I checked was if anything was getting hot on the board, indicating a short. And sure enough, there was a dead short across the 3.3 volt rail. I fixed it by reflowing the main microcontroller, and after that, the shorts were gone, and I could upload code to the board. Now initially, I was still quite saddened by what I saw, because my blink sketch would not blink the LED at all, and connecting the LED across 3.3 volts and ground also didn't illuminate it, so I ended up growing quite concerned. However, I quickly figured out that I was viewing the pinout of my board upside down in KiCad because I had flipped the board view to solder the components to the bottom and had forgotten to flip it back. Therefore, I was plugging the LED into the wrong pins. And I also learned that the reason the 3.3 volt output wasn't working was because I ordered the new boards without remembering to fix the 3.3 volt pins net flags. Thankfully, this was fixable with a simple bodge wire, so after putting the LED in the right spot, I was greeted with the sweet indication of success a blinking LED. Of course, just getting a blink sketch running means that uploading code works properly and the microcontroller is at least able to execute the code too. However, I had run into some issues with the solder connections on the RP2040 chips not being made properly during the initial soldering, meaning I'd have to go back and fix some of them during the cleanup phase. This was fine, but after my first board, I went on to make the other 14 of them, and so I became afraid I might have missed a solder joint or two on a few of the microcontrollers, which could cause some serious confusion when using them, 
to prototype projects in the future. So I set up this little rig, a ton of three millimeter blue LEDs on a breadboard that uses every single GPIO pin on the RP2040, meaning that I'll be able to see if any are bridged or not connected. Also, fun fact while I test some of these boards, the Pico only has 23 GPIO pins broken out, whereas my board has 30. So you can actually utilize every single pin on this chip, which I think is really awesome. I did find several defects on several boards, all of which were quickly remedied, and now I've got an army of 15 of my custom RP2040 based boards that I'm super proud of. These boards have more flash storage, more GPIOs, take less space, and have a better USB connector than the original Pi Pico, and that's why I'm so proud of them. I'm looking forward to using these microcontrollers in future projects, and I also can't wait to expand on this project in the future. I have some ideas, such as making a version based on the RP2350, and another version with the model of the 2350 that has a ton of extra I.O. Plus, with the USB-C port, how cool would it be if I directed some of the extra I.O. on the bigger 2350 to controlling an onboard PD trigger chip that meant you could have up to a 20 volt supply coming out of your microcontroller? So yeah, I have a lot of ideas for where I could take this project in the future, and I hope that you'll stick along for the ride for when I choose to chase them. But with that, that's all I have for you in this video. I hope that you were able to enjoy it, and maybe even learn a thing or two. In any case, I hope to see you next time. Goodbye.